So it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce today's uh, Simon Center uh, speaker, um, <coughs> Guy Ro Rolo. I hope I, this is French, so I'm not good at French at all, actually. And <coughs> Guy is uh, um, uh, one of the pioneers in uh, study gen use genetics to study uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders. He's currently a director of Montreal Neurological Institute, also the chair of the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery uh, in McGill University. Um, he actually did uh, his MD in uh, University of Ottawa, then did his PhD in genetics at Harvard um, uh, University. Then he spent the uh, first part of his career at uh, McGill University as a faculty for almost 15 years, and then moved to um, um, uh, University of Montreal, and for for a few uh, for a few years, uh, uh, going back to be the director actually as the uh, uh, the famous neuro, uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, and he has won many many awards for his research, um, um, many international awards and also many uh, awards from Canada, and uh, including the um, Michael Smith Award from the Canadian uh, uh, Neurological Institute of, of uh, Mental uh, Health Research. And he also sits on many of the advisory boards for the government and for, for the scientific um, institutions and the industries. Uh, his research is really um, benefited many, many of, actually opened the door for many of the uh, neurological and uh, neuroscience research around the world. And uh, give you a few examples of, um, here at MIT, we are very familiar. He is one of the first to identify genetic mutations of Shank3 in um, a small group of schizophrenia patients. He also was uh, one of the um, uh, uh, scientists who discovered patch D1 in intellectual disability and in, uh, in uh, um, uh, autism. So um, interestingly, we, uh, actually, we work on both of the genes. <laughs> so we benefit a lot from his very insightful genetic studies and I think Today, he's going to uh, talk about and um, uh, cover the, mostly on the genetic um, aspect of how we use the uh, cutting edge genetic studies and uh, getting insight on the neurological and the psychiatric disorders, especially in schizophrenia and autism. Welcome. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, I'm gonna start by apologizing because I'm, I'm actually going to go way back in the history of my thinking, our thinking about uh, these diseases and walk you through a little bit uh, how we landed, where we landed. And so it's going to be a lot of genetics uh, at the, at the, for the first half. Uh, and then uh, towards uh, the end, I think it'll be some more new stuff, which I think I, hopefully you'll find it all interesting. But the, the, the genetics is going to be a lot of genetics. And so uh, I'll uh, walk you through this. So I'm going to talk about genomics of neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and I have to say that I have no conflicts of interest and no financial interests. Uh, the people in my lab uh, insist that I put another disclaimer that I actually did none of the work I'm going to talk about. So now that you know, I'm going to talk about these, uh, this, this project. So I look at, I've always looked at neurodevelopmental disorders as being a group of disorders. There are many of them. And uh, our focus has been on some of the common ones. Schizophrenia and autism have been the, my major interest, but also intellectual uh, disability or deficiency. And as I said, I'm going to start this, this journey. I said 2004, but it actually started in 1998, but I actually didn't start uh, getting money to do things until uh, 2004. So just a few words. Schizophrenia, major mental disorder, affects about 1% of the human population, and disease is characterized by a wide spectrum of symptoms, perfect, profoundly affect uh, cognition, behavior, and emotional processes. Now, uh, there have been many, many, many genetic studies in, uh, in uh, schizophrenia. This is one of my, my favorite uh, uh, pictures. Essentially is, if one person has schizophrenia, what is the risk of these various relatives of having schizophrenia? And so, if you have, uh, uh, if there's a, a, an individual with schizophrenia, the chances of his sibling or her sibling having schizophrenia is 9%. The chance of having uh, schizophrenia, if your identical twin has schizophrenia, it's about 50%, so it's not 100%, 50% indicating that there's a incomplete penetrance. Uh, but what I find interesting is that what is the likelihood of your parents having schizophrenia at 6%, sibs 9%, children 
uh, 13%. And so, so there seems to be a differential frequency of having or risk of having schizophrenia if you go up to the parents or if you go down. And that is kind of a first hint that there may be something going on uh, with a fraction of cases which may uh, indicate a special uh, mechanism for this disease. Now, this is a, a famous equation which basically, when one are, does genetics, one thinks about heritability, and the, the measure heritability is usually done using twin studies. And so this is simply a study, uh, 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 a graphical representation of two individuals, and if these individuals are identical twins, then the H, the hereditary component, is the same. If they're uh, fraternal twins, or if they're uh, brothers and sisters, fraternal twins, then H here is one half H there. And then you have the shared environment and you have the non-shared environment. And believe me, you know, anybody in the room I'm sure could sit down and derive these equations, but this is the important one, which is the heritability is essentially equal to two times the uh, monozygotic risk minus the dizygotic risk. So in fact, if we do here, you can do the quick calculation. 48 uh, minus uh, 9 uh, times 2. So this uh, gives numbers. There are about 30 twin studies have been done. They've been separated in the first generation, the second generation. Essentially, in all of them, the monozygotic concordance is much higher than the dizygotic concordance. And the contemporary twin studies seem to show a heritability of around 82 to 84% indicating that the risk for developing schizophrenia is highly genetic, 82 to 84%. But remember that the penetrance is not 100% because it is 50% concordance of monozygotic twins. So genes are necessary but not sufficient. Okay. Uh, schizophrenia genetics, uh, and here uh, there are some of my colleagues who might not agree with me, but this is what I think. Uh, linkage studies and genome-wide association studies have failed to explain the bulk of the heritability. So this 82% heritability, uh, maybe a few percent can be explained by uh, what has been found using these studies. Only a few genes had been convincingly linked to schizophrenia, if this is one goes back to uh, 2004, 2006. And CNV studies have indicated that there may be a role for CNVs, including de novo CNVs in schizophrenia. So, but the bottom line is very little of this uh, large heritability chunk has been explained. Autism, I'm going to go quickly because everybody knows about this disease. So, essentially, autism spectrum disorder, uh, the core problems of language, social interaction, and repetitive movements. Age of onset is younger. And uh, the prevalence is a moving target, but uh, now most people would talk about a prevalence of 1% using the current definition of autism or autism spectrum disorder. Here again, twin and family studies show a high heritability, at least 90%. In fact, uh, some of the twin studies indicate that the heritability is 100%. But uh, there is a little bit of controversy, but most people would agree that uh, it is a highly heritable trait. Again, linkage studies and genome-wide association studies have failed to explain the bulk of the heritability. Here, nobody would argue with me. Uh, a number of genes have been identified, uh, but they can only explain a small number of cases. And uh, CNV studies, as for schizophrenia, indicate uh, a role for CNV studies and uh, de novo mutations, de novo CNVs. But again, little of the heritability has been explained. So this is a key point. I had one paper rejected for this reason because the reviewers didn't understand this point. So I, I want to make this very clear. So heritability is a measure using twins, monozygotic and dizygotic twins. But there are two possible explanations for a very high monozygotic and a low dizygotic concordance. Okay. One, which is the one that's in all the books, is that the inheritance of many different predisposing alleles need, are needed to act together. So let's suppose papa has three alleles that are not good. Mama has three alleles that are not good, but three is not enough to develop the disease. One child gets the three bad ones from the father, the three bad ones from the mother, Nobody's doing on purpose here. This is just chance. And so one individual has the disease. But what is the chance of the other siblings having the same six? It's really very small. So you have one individual who's affected. If it's a monozygotic, monozygotic twins, then both are genetically identical. Both will have the same six variants. Okay? That's the classic explanation in all the books. 
But another explanation is the de novo mutations could also do the same thing. So if you have a de novo mutation in the sperm or the egg that forms one individual who then becomes, they become uh, monozygotic twins, so two individuals who have the same genetic makeup, that de novo mutation is going to be present in both, which could explain a high monozygotic concordance if it's a penetrant allele. And then for uh, fraternal twins, then one might have a de novo mutation, the other one will not because the novel mutations are rare events, and so they will be discordant. <clears throat> and so, in fact, uh, this is kind of what I would favor, or I have favored for many years, as being the best explanation for this very large difference in the monozygotic versus dizygotic twin concordance, as opposed to this uh, multiple allele hypothesis. What I was struck, I started in doing genetics of cancer, uh, brain tumors, brain cancer, and I was always struck by the fact that there are de novo mutations are a common cause of hereditary cancer syndromes, whether they be NF1, NF2, leaf romani syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasias. And I always wondered, what about the thousands of genes that are involved in neurodevelopment? What if you had de novo mutations in these genes? Could they have a phenotype? It can't be that there's only a phenotype in the cancer genes and no phenotype for all the other de novo mutations. Okay. So this is a, also a very classic uh, uh, picture which shows everything one needs to know about genetics. Essentially, one has penetrance and one has allele frequencies, and those are the two most important components. Uh, and so uh, Mendelian genetics looks at rare penetrant alleles, and genome-wide association looks at common low penetrance alleles. And so G GWAS has looked here, and uh, Mendelian diseases have looked here. Where would de novo mutations fall here? Well, de novo mutations would fall here as rare penetrant alleles. Okay? But if you don't look for de novo mutations, you will not be able to, to identify them. And then there are, of course, rare variants that are small effects. Those aren't important. There are some variants that have high effects uh, that are more common, and this is more like sickle cell anemia in areas that have very strong, uh, very strong uh, selective bias for having uh, alleles which can be uh, positive in certain circumstances, even though overall they cause disease. And here, this low frequent variance with intermediate effects, this is a large unexplored territory that we're just beginning to look at. Uh, and so as one of my students said like 10 years ago, genetics is over, there's nothing else to do. Well, they were wrong. We have uh, just started. So. Our hypothesis was then that the genetic architecture of schizophrenia, autism, and intellectual disability was multiple rare variants, and I thought it fits with the complexity of the brain, uh, and that the idea that these are not diseases but syndromes. So schizophrenia is not a disease, it is a group of different diseases where our ability to phenotype is not very good, so they all kind of look the same. And one can say the same thing for autism and for intellectual disability. Uh, however, uh, there must be a selection against these. If this is rare, if it's true that there are multiple rare variants that are penetrant, quite penetrant, there has to be a strong selection against these deleterious alleles for these diseases to remain high frequency, autism 1%, schizophrenia 1%. Okay? So what's the evidence for that? Well, first of all, de novo mutations are common. There is one de de deleterious mutation occurs about uh, one per zygote, zygote. These are deleterious coding mutations. About 60 to 100 de novo mutations per genome. And there are diseases like Rett syndrome that many of you know, I'm sure, have an incidence of 1 in 10 to 15,000 females. And new mutations explain almost 100% of Rett syndrome. And so that indicates that the new, new mutation rate is 1 in 5,000 to 1 in 7,500 live births. So that's quite common. If you had 1,000 genes that predisposed to schizophrenia and you had these kinds of of rates of, of mutation of these thousand genes, then you could predict that it could explain uh, a large fraction of these diseases. And this is just a little simple math. If you assume there are 20 genes, 20,000 genes, two times 10 to the eight births, then uh, every year, every gene in the human genome is mutated to a null 10,000 times. And so there are a lot of de novo mutations that are affecting lots of genes. So what about these predictions? So one would predict then that there should be re re reduced reproductive fitness in these diseases. Well, in fact, uh, the rates of reproduction are much decreased in both schizophrenia and autism. Again, negative selection should get rid of these alleles. Uh, but these two diseases have high prevalence across the world. 
And that's kind of odd. So if you have a diseases that, that cause decreased reproductive fitness, how could you have high incidence of this disease all over the world and that it be maintained over time? It doesn't make sense. So there's a strong positive selection against these diseases. So the only explanation is new disease alleles need to be created continuously. And it's a balance of new alleles being created and the alleles being eliminated from the population because of reduced reproductive fitness. And so uh, I've never seen an, another explanation for the high uniform incidence of these diseases across the world than it being a balance between de novo mutations and eliminating the alleles from the population. So again, supports a de novo mutation hypothesis. Effects of paternal age, well, the male to female ratio of de novo mutations is, is high. More males than females have point mutations. And that the mutation rate increases with paternal age. So as papa gets older, the chances of his sperm having a de novo mutation increases significantly. And so it would predict that de novo mutations would more frequently come from males, particularly older males. Well, in fact, if you look at NF1 and Rett syndrome, the disease alleles, the de novo mutations, most frequently come from the males, most frequently come from the older males. And clinical studies have looked at schizophrenia, autism, and intellectual disability. And in fact, yes, there is an increased risk of having a child with any of these three diseases with increasing paternal age. And so that is consistent with uh, a role for de novo mutations. So this is in the old days, uh, 2004, 2005, before next-gen sequencing. Uh, we uh, created a project to test this hypothesis. We wanted to look for rare penetrant de novo mutations that cause these neurodevelopmental disorders. And because it was not next-gen sequencing, you had to sequence using Sanger sequencing, uh, we wanted to focus on a group of genes, and we thought that synaptic genes were a reasonable place to look for genes that might predispose to these diseases. And we could talk about that after, but I think it's, it seems obvious. So we created this project, basically identify, annotate, and catalog all the genes coding for synaptic proteins. We ended up with about 3,500. We want to screen 1,000 of these genes uh, in uh, cases of autism, uh, schizophrenia, and mental retardation. Why 1,000? Uh, well, because we, uh, when we submitted the, the grant, it was like a few weeks after a paper came out on the proteomics of the, of the synapse, and there was 1,001 genes in the proteome study. Uh, as it turns out, it was an underestimate, uh, but that's fine. It, it served our purpose. And then we used uh, synaptic worm, fly, fish, uh, and mouse cell models to validate the human variants. And I'll give examples of that. I don't want to waste your time with this, but this is basically a big project, millions of, uh, millions of fragments, uh, and uh, cost a fortune. The uh, functional validation using these four systems is very simple. You knock down the gene. For example, in zebrafish, you look for a phenotype. If there's a phenotype, you rescue with a normal human gene. If you rescue, then you try to rescue with a mutated allele, and this will tell you if it is a loss of function allele. Okay, very simple. For, and you can overexpress the mutation to look for a gain of function allele. So this is a screen. Uh, it turned out that it worked best in zebrafish and in neuronal cells because we found more homologs of the human genes. Uh, zebrafish turned out to be the best, though, from the point of view of being able to do this rapidly. So a few results. Well, remember, these are the old days. So a fraction of the DNA that was sequenced was, was not or minimally constrained, meaning that it's in tronic sequence or it is the wobble in, of the codon, and that uh, one would not expect that these would uh, have a, a selective effect, having mutations in these, in these regions. And so from all the sequencing we did, Sanger sequencing we did, we could calculate the neutral rate uh, of, uh, of mutation of de novo, uh, sorry, of, of uh, yeah, de novo mutations in normal DNA was 1.4 times 10 to the minus 8. And as it turns out, that's just about what is, is also found using uh, next-gen sequencing. So it was uh, the first, the, it was the only direct measure of uh, the mutation rate in humans uh, using Sanger sequencing and one of the first ever done. We did 402 genes. Remember I said we were going to do 1,000. We stopped at 402. Uh, because new technology came. So when we stopped at 402, we found 15 de novo mutations. And essentially, the work was all the single variants that we found, then 
We would then test the parents, so a lot of, of sequencing. Uh, but what we found is that the, the ratio of nonsense to missense de novo mutations was 2 to 5. The neutral model predicts it should be 1 to 20. So the neutral model is if you take exonic sequence and you do any kind of mutation, you do random mutation, about 1 out of 20 is going to lead to a stop codon. And here we get basically a ratio of 2 to 5 instead of a ratio of 1 to 20. And this is significantly different, so that indicates that uh, that the, uh, some of the uh, disease-associated novel mutations are likely disease-causing. So there's an excess of bad mutations in, uh, de novo, in the de novo mutations. Then we looked at the rate, and rate is maybe not the best uh, term because the rate suggests that these individuals, well, anyway, what we find is that there's a higher frequency of uh, de novo mutations in the schizophrenia and autism cases than in the controls or than what we would expect. The reason is not that they have a higher rate of mutation, as been suggested in one paper, but rather it's an ascertainment bias. So we are ascertaining individuals that are likely to have the disease we are ascertaining because they have had a de novo mutation. So the rate is not higher in these individuals. It's because we're choosing individuals with de novo mutations that we find more. But there's an excess. And these are some of the genes we found. So this is in autism. Uh, we found Shank 3. We weren't the first, but uh, we also found Shank 3 mutations, IL1, RAPL1, and so on and so forth. Okay? And these are the genes, these are the genes we found in uh, schizophrenia. We found two Shank 3s, uh, KIF17, uh, Norexin. And, uh, and this is just, I'm throwing in intellectual disability because I'm not really going to talk about it in this talk, but we also found quite a few. Uh, Syngap uh, 1 uh, is a common one. Many others, again, Shank, shank 3. Okay. So this is, this is what we do. This is what we did. We find mutations, and then how do we validate them? And there, I have a couple of examples of the validating. And it's always the same. We're very boring. We just do the same thing all the time. So we found a mutation. We screen other individuals, and we look for mutations. In, in this case, in Kinesin 17, we didn't find any. Though it's an interesting one because it's, it's known to traffic GRIN2B, which is thought to be uh, uh, important in these diseases. It's a protein truncating mutation in the middle. Uh, this is the sequence. You get a shorter truncated protein. It is a de novo mutation. It's not present in the parents. And we always test the parents to be sure that the DNA of the people that we think are the parents is the DNA of the of the parents of the individual that we are sequencing. Uh, so we're sure that, in fact, that these are true families. And here we did, uh, <clears throat> we, this is a Morpholino experiment in zebrafish. And essentially, here you have a normal, uh, normal fish. They, uh, they have, uh, this is uh, basically, they have a curling phenotype and a swimming phenotype. If you knock it down, the fish are not normal. If you try to rescue, with the uh, mutant, you can't rescue. Okay? So it indicates that this is a, a loss of functional allele. IL-1, RAPL-1, this is an autism patient. This has actually been replicated a few months ago. This is an X-linked gene, uh, but in fact, here is the same story. Here's the pedigree. The parents don't have the mutation, de novo mutation in the child. This is a truncated protein. It truncates the protein about in the middle. We pre predicted to not be uh, to be deleterious, and here this is uh, using primary cultures of uh, cortical neurons that are uh, infected uh, using uh, a virus. Either uh, this is a normal. This is if you uh, and this is uh, looking at IL-1, RAPL-1 antibody, and this is merged, and so you can see normally RAPL-1. There's a lot of branching, and it's in the in the branches. If you knock it down, there's much less branching. If you knock it down and you rescue with the wild type, you get the branching back. And if you knock it down, you try to rescue with the mutant, not surprisingly, you have uh, no rescue, and so this mutant is non-functional. This is the Shank 3 uh, story. Again, this was a deletion and a splice donor that leads to a truncated protein, a de novo mutation. And because uh, Shank had been uh, shown before, we, uh, we didn't include uh, any uh, knockdown experiments in this. We were kind of surprised when we found two uh, de novo mutations in Shank 3 uh, in schizophrenia cases. And uh, this is the proband, and this is the other proband. So one is a stop codon, is a protein-curcating mutation. The other one is a missense mutation. 
And this protein truncating mutation we found in this boy, uh, we had two affected brothers in this, in, in this family. And when we tested the two affected brothers, they both had the same mutation. So that's kind of surprising that all three have the same mutation. We checked, and these are definitely the parents of these boys. And in fact, we showed that this mutation is on the paternal chromosome, and the father is likely a germline mosaic. And in fact, germline mosaicism explains a few percent of, uh, of these uh, cases usually, and, and is the explanation when you have more than one affected individual uh, when you do have the, the true biological parents. So three individuals with Shank 3 mutation, all three with schizophrenia. Uh, this individual with schizophrenia. This is the, uh, this is the experiments using uh, the fish. Uh, and essentially, it, this is the control fish. This is a, a swimming phenotype. If you knock it down, you have a severe phenotype in the majority of the fish. If you try to rescue with the wild type human Shank 3 uh, cDNA, you get partial rescue. Most have a mild phenotype. If you try to rescue with the knockout, with the truncated protein, you have uh, really no, not much of a, but not, maybe a little bit of a rescue, but not a significant rescue. And if you try to rescue with the, this point mutation, you do rescue, indicating that this allele in this assay is not a uh, loss of function. So we're left with the question, uh, is this a true disease predisposing mutation, or is this just uh, by chance that we found this? Uh, I don't know to this day, but it would take somebody to do the biology to figure it out. So what are the outcomes? Well, we measured the de novo mutation rate in humans. We provided support for the hypothesis that schizophrenia and autism are uh, result from, uh, at least in a, a number of cases, from de novo mutation. Suggested the genetic architecture is that of many rare variants in many genes. And it's likely that a fraction of these de novo mutations are disease-causing. So we're looking at penetrant uh, alleles. <coughs> so as I said, you know, as this program was chugging along, uh, new technology arrived, and we were very keen to use this technology. This is the dropping price of sequencing. Uh, and so uh, we uh, adopted uh, HiSeq uh, 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 Illumina sequencing, and you know, it was really not simple to get it done because uh, we're not the Broad uh, who have a gazillion dollars and uh, infinite numbers of machines. So uh, I had a friend who had a machine in Hong Kong who did some of it, and I had another friend at the Genome Center that I bribed to pass some of our stuff through. So uh, we managed to get the sequencing done. Uh, this is the next-gen sequencing. Uh, the advantage is, of course, you look at all the genes, so there's no bias. We were only looking at synaptic genes. It's biased. Uh, this is non-biased, and um, it's, it's, a, it's a great method to look for these kinds of mutations. We ended up by studying 14 trios. Uh, again, uh, because of cost and availability of machines, we used a relatively small number of cases. In addition, these are trios from France where they had, uh, where there was uh, excellent uh, phenotyping. So as opposed to most studies that use large groups of people with uh, schizophrenia, the phenotypes is often not as clearly defined, but these are excellent phenotype uh, by uh, uh, an excellent uh, psychiatrist, all the same individual. And in fact, uh, they did look to see if there was, uh, there was schizophrenia or some major uh, psychiatric illness in the family, and if there wasn't in the parents. Uh, we wanted to have no significant psychiatric illness in any first degree relative, but it seems as if that doesn't exist. And so, uh, there's a lot of, of, of mental illness in this world. But still, the parents did not have schizophrenia. We did exon capture and you know, don't need to go through the details. This is a little hard to see, but this is all the mutations that we found, the de novo mutations. In red are the protein truncating ones. And so now I'm going to repeat myself uh, what, what, uh, what I said earlier. Uh, we didn't find uh, Shang-3 uh, this time. Where are the genes? Here are the genes. Uh, but we did find some, uh, some, interesting, uh, some interesting genes, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So the Nova re if you look at the de novo mutation rate, again, you would expect that uh, what, what we observe is 2 pi 4 to the 10 to the minus 8 de novo mutations. We expect 1.2, so there's an excess of de novo mutations. So again, there are more de novo mutations in these cases than you would expect by chance. 
And if you look at the type of mutation here, the ratio is 4 to 14, uh, 4 out of 14 instead of 1 out of 20. And again, it, it is an, there is an excess. And so the mutations, there are more de novo mutations and they are badder. Okay? So what did we do? We just replicated our first study. Okay? So that was good because nobody believed our first study and I could tell you stories about that paper that took uh, almost three years to publish. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, we did find an excess of deleterious mutations, and we uh, think that this supports the notion that de novo mutations can explain part of the missing heritability. And after that, uh, uh, other groups started uh, doing additional studies looking uh, at exome sequencing, uh, including groups here at the Broad. And so this is just a small selection of, of papers. Now there are uh, at least a dozen papers looking at de novo mutations in uh, schizophrenia, autism, and also intellectual disability. Okay. So when, when the Broad started getting involved, we decided that we would not stay in the field because we could not compete with the Broad. Uh, anyhow, the Broad does their things very well, so I thought we'll let them uh, do that. We decided to, to switch and look at another entity we became very interested in this overlap between uh, autism and schizophrenia, which I'll talk about a little later. But uh, there is an entity called childhood onset schizophrenia. It's essentially age of onset less than 13 years of age. It's, it's quite rare. Usually after seven years of age, they develop positive and negative symptoms. And there's often other cognitive uh, impairment. Uh, this is a, 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 a diagnostic entity that has been championed by Dr. Uh, Rappaport, who is our collaborator in this, and, uh, uh, and she's been a great collaborator. Uh, there's often early developmental abnormalities, a lot of positive symptoms, language and speech disorder, and a lot of comorbidity, ADHD, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, etc., anxiety disorders. So these are complex patients, and these certainly looks like a complex trait, uh, no clear pattern of inheritance, uh, moderate to strong evidence of being inherited, common. And so uh, one really uh, we're faced with, with the unknown. Some genetic studies had been done and uh, some family-based association studies uh, that had mild positivity. There was a CNV studies, a couple of them that indicated the presence of a couple of de novo CNVs. Uh, and there was one uh, study looking at rare variants. Uh, and this is actually uh, our study with, uh, with uh, Dr. Rappaport found mutations in, in de novo mutations in UPF3B in this disease. So we decided again to do the same thing. Uh, we wanted to look at trios. Uh, we ended up with a, a total of 20 trios, 60 individuals. And uh, we uh, essentially did the classic, uh, classic uh, pipeline. And we ended up with 20 de novo variants in these 20 trios. This is one way to show the de novo mutations. So these individuals have one de novo mutation, these have two, these have three, and this one has four. And uh, you would expect uh, that uh, the average number of de novo mutations would be uh, a, a little bit more than one. And in fact, the observed rate is 2.2 times 10 to the minus eight, very similar to what we found in schizophrenia earlier, indicating that there is an excess of de novo mutations in individuals with childhood onset schizophrenia. These are the mutations we found. In contrast, we found no uh, nonsense mutations. Uh, we found 15 missense, four synonymous, and two small indels. People who are counting quickly are saying this is 21, and I said there are 20. Uh, but in fact, as you'll see, there's uh, two mutations that are counted here uh, in a riornidin receptor. Where is it? Uh, anyhow, you'll see it later. But essentially, we think that those two mutations occurred or two bases apart, so we thought that they occurred probably as a single event, which is why we counted them as 20. So we wanted to compare the non-synonymous to the synonymous frequency, and what we find is that there is, a, this is for example of private inherited variants, this is the ratio of common inherited variants, this is the ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous. We find 3.75, and so indicating that there's an excess of non-synonymous to synonymous, and so these are not uh, protein truncating, but these are mutations that uh, affect an amino acid. Uh, we wanted to use some bioinf bio bioinformatic methods. We use polyphen, and uh, we use the, what's called RVIS, 
uh, which essentially is a measure of how well genes can tolerate having uh, mutations. And so this is a, a violin plot showing uh, the lower severity and higher severity. And so this is what you have with private inherited mutations. With the de novo cost that we have, you can see that there's a lot of mutations that are predicted to be deleterious, high severity, slimmer, similar to studies done by others uh, in schizophrenia and autism, indicating that, that these mutations, maybe they're not protein truncating, but they're predicted using the bioinformatics to be uh, deleterious. This is the uh, RVIS score, and we see, uh, again, the same kind of thing. The score, the lower the score, the more severe the mutations, and you can see that, uh, that the mutations are more frequently in genes that tolerate less well having mutations, and it's actually a little bit better than, than, than these studies, but still is uh, significant. It's just another way of showing it, and it's, this is the important part to look at. This is the mean polyphen score, and so this is for random mutations. Uh, you have a normal distribution. If you look at the de novo mutations that we found, they all land up here near the higher deleterious score, indicating that they seem to be in excess of severe mutations. And this is, uh, again, with the RVIS score. And here, again, you have a random distribution. If you do random mutagenesis, you end up with a random distribution of severity. But in the case of the de novo mutations, the vast majority are right here in the uh, less well tolerated. This is the ry ryonidin receptor 2 I mentioned. Uh, this is where there were two mutations, uh, which were these, uh, at, uh, which re results in, uh, in two different changes. Q, Q to Y is the normal, Q to H is a mutant, and the, the variants are one beside the other, so we think it was one mutational event. These are some of the more interesting genes that we found mutations in. One is in the, this gene, which calls, causes williams burin syndrome, uh, which is known to have cognitive abnormalities. Ryonidin receptor has been implicated in autism and in de novo and epileptic encephalopathies. One seizure disorder gene, one gene for which there's de novo mutations is schizophrenia, and one gene, whether it's related or not, uh, has been implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So summary, we find an increased rate of de novo mutations. Uh, missense variants show a high degree of pathogenicity compared to what would it, we would expect and sort of indicates that these de novo mutations, some of them may in fact be uh, involved in developing the phenotype. So early onset neurodevelopmental disorder like COS, uh, we thought that these mutations would be more severe and this is what we found, but we would need a larger cohort to, uh, to replicate this uh, and this is ongoing as we speak. And biology needs to be done to look at these candidates. <coughs> Now, this is a summary of, of, of some of the genes that have been implicated in more than one disease. So here you have the diseases, uh, autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia or COS, uh, non-syndromic intellectual disability, Tourette's, bipolar, ADHD, and Rett syndrome. And you can see that there are a number of genes like DISC1, like Norexin1, and Shank3, and CNTNAP2 have been found to be mutated in all three of these diseases. Some, like for example, neuroligans also been found in Tourette syndrome. In fact, uh, there is one report in Tourette syndrome and we have found a de novo mutation in Tourette syndrome as well. So neuroligan four, uh, it looks like it's real. And uh, these other diseases certainly don't fit though as well. There are many that are in common, some that are only in two. And there seems to be more overlap between non-syndromic intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder than either one with uh, schizophrenia or COS but it's still uh, the early days. But the conclusion is that there's an incumulating evidence that these three diseases uh, might be on the same developmental uh, continuum. Remember, as I said earlier, and as I'm sure all of you know, these are not one disease, these are syndromes, and in these syndromes, some overlap, some of the uh, subtypes will overlap between the different diseases, and, uh, and I think this is what this genetic data seems to be indicating. So what next? Well, there are a lot of important questions to ask. Uh, which of these genes are involved in schizophrenia and which are benign variants? Remember that we have de novo mutations occur. So to have a de novo mutation does not mean that that's a causative gene. That just means that it is a candidate to be causative. 
What fraction of schizophrenia or autism can be explained by de novo mutations? Uh, I was speaking this morning with uh, some people at the MGH. And anyhow, for autism, it looks like depending on the definition of autism, it can be quite high, the fraction. If we're looking at severe autism, it can be up to 50%. Um, but of course, again, autism is a, a spectrum. And there's uh, all kinds of severe and less severe cases. So I think more work needs to be done. And can we link these through pathways? Uh, and uh, we became interested in the de novo mutation rate, and we're working on this now, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to present that today. Just going to talk about one of the methods that we thought would be useful to be able to answer the first question, which which are the genes found in the de novo studies that are involved in, uh, in disease? Well, the hypothesis is this, and, and here you're going to think I'm contradicting myself, but I'm not. Uh, the genes found in de novo mutation studies that are involved in schizophrenia should have a higher number of mutations or mutation burden uh, in schizophrenia than in controls. Okay? So I'm saying de novo mutations predispose to disease, but I'm also saying that these same genes should have more mutations in them in cases of schizophrenia than, one, than controls. How can that be? Well, one comes back to the penetrance. The penetrance is 50%. So 50% of people who have a de novo mutation in one of these, a, a, a penetrant de novo mutation in one of these genes will not have schizophrenia. But that person may have children, and he's, his or her children will be at risk for schizophrenia. So uh, the reason that I can say this for schizophrenia is that uh, the penetrance, even of the very penetrant alleles, is, pro is not 100%. It's probably or in the order of 50%. So we did a pilot study. Wanted to look at 240 patients, 240 controls, look at the mutation burden. We use the haplo, haplo, haloplex method. Uh, and we wanted to look at different sets. So I'll explain here what these different sets are. So these are the genes found by exome capture, uh, by the, in schizophrenia in the exome capture study that I showed, the study number two. Uh, this is the, uh, these are the genes that we found de novo mutations in using the Sanger sequencing part of the project. Uh, this is a paper that came out by Zoom.